Hi, I'm Patricia Allingham Carlson, and this is my video of how I painted Hungry Koi, step by step. You know, we built with our own hands a small koi pond in our backyard, rock by rock, and we did, did the whole thing, including the water filtration system. We get a lot of pleasure sitting and watching the koi, and I take a lot of pictures of them. We enjoy feeding them every night, and when they come up to eat, they sure do look funny. They have big mouths, and they suck at the surface, make a lot of noise, splash around. Of course, they're hungry, and that's why they're doing it. So I decided to paint from one of my photographs that I took, and this is Hungry Koi. Hope you enjoy it and give it a thumbs up. That's real helpful to me. Now let's paint. I decided to paint this by copying as exactly as I could the patterns of the water and the fish and their bodies and anatomy onto some watercolor paper. This is Arches, which I happen to have as a favorite. I'm using something called graphite paper, which is a kind of transfer paper. I'm taping it onto my watercolor paper, and then I'm taping loosely my photograph that I printed out on top of that. So this is Sally's Artist Graphite Paper, and I found it works pretty well. What I need now is to go over the whole thing with firm pressure and a pencil. I'm outlining all the different ripples in the water, many of the water patterns, and the basic anatomy of the koi bodies. You know, in the water, reflections get wavery and different. The water changes the reflective qualities of everything. So I thought this would be an interesting way to attempt that. So, line by line and shape by shape, I am outlining with a pencil. I'm taking a little peek to see if enough transferred or if I need to press a little harder in some spots. When I have a good transfer, I'm going to remove all this extra stuff, get set up, and start to paint. I've gone over a palette already using different kinds of colors of blue. So I arbitrarily pick a section in the water, and that's where I'll paint. But first I decide I should use some masking fluid to keep some strong whites that I won't accidentally paint over. I think white reflections are important in a painting about water. Once that's completed, I am picking a section where there's a little bit of orange fish showing from underneath the water and painting in the blues all around it. I use a lot of a color called Veritor Blue. It starts with a V for this painting. But I'm also using Cobalt Blue, Ultramarine Blue, and Intense Blue. I figured the different shades of blue might make the painting fun and interesting since I happen to love blue. Whereas the bright colors of orange and red and gold were what caught my eye in the first place in the color contrast of the photograph I took of our koi. First sections have been painted, and they look rather interesting, like an abstract painting. And 
and I'm just following the outlines of what I saw on the paper along with looking at an image of my photograph and using that as a reference as well. Some of the sections I'm painting wet on wet and some of them are totally dry. It's just going along by instinct of what looks right and looks interesting to me. This took a lot of time and a lot of patience, but it was a new way and a new approach for me. And I found it very interesting and even calming to have everything spelled out for me already. And all I needed to do was fill in and play around and have some fun. I'm getting down to the section around the koi. In many cases, I'm making the water darker where the koi are emerging, and you'll see that continue because it sets them off and sets off the vivid colors that the fish have. Normally the water is far more placid, but the koi in their eating are disturbing it a lot. They're making whirlpools and swirls and bubbles and all kinds of stuff going on. And it provides a nice energy to the painting. I'm getting to a complicated place in the painting, again, where the fish's colors show through the water without showing the fish clearly. I'm enjoying the challenge. Getting the orange down and the blues down, allowing them to mingle and blend, and yet keeping some of the orange very fresh, as well as the blue. As we all know, if you mix blue and orange together, you're going to end up with gray. And that's a good color for some areas, but if you want brights, you can't let them mix together too strongly. So the orange of the fish is swirling through the blue, mixing occasionally, and at the same time I'm conveying ripples and a whirlpool is going to be appearing underneath this orangey-blue area as well. If you work totally wet on wet, you don't have the control to keep your colors more separate. You can work damp on damp and keep your colors fresher. And I also frequently use an approach where I drop color in or just put it on and leave it alone to spread by itself as opposed to painting it on. And you could see me doing this when I get too close to another color that would compromise my bright. So I'm putting the bright in, then carefully going around it with some dampness, and then carefully bringing in the blues and allowing them to mix just at the edges. It takes a lot of practice to do that. but it works for me. You'll have to let me know in comments what works for you. If you like the blended edge coloring. So here's that whirlpool I was talking about. I'm trying to form it and keep it soft enough so it looks like water. 
and yet convey the movement of the water within the form. Painting in darks and then I'm blending the edges out with water. I'm trying to keep some of the interior parts where the shine would be fresh and unpainted at all. I'd never painted a whirlpool before, so that was sort of a challenge. Oh, an interesting one. Now I've painted into the wet background the blended form of another koi, and you can see that on the right side there. He's picking up some stronger colors from his head, and then his body goes back down into the water. So I've only just suggested his body with some patterns of indigo and orange. And I've done a lot of blending into that fish. You can see I've retained the whites that go on top of him to try to convey the water that's flowing over him. Two more little fish have joined in the lower perimeters. The one with the white one with the red head and an orange one who's sort of going off the page. And now I'm working on a fish who's very light in color. And carefully painting around the trio of fish at the surface with their open mouths. You could see how their heads sort of appear to ripple or waver, and that's because of the flow of the water. And I thought that was an interesting feature and made sure that I drew it from the photograph and tried to incorporate it. It's a bright orange and black fish. And he's the lowest of the trio. And I'm painting along all of my outlines that you probably can't see clearly, but they are on the paper. Almost like a coloring book that I created, but I'm painting them in myself and I drew them myself. Now I wanted these fish to be very bright so they would really pop out against the blues of the water. So I probably put three layers of paint on them or glazed them three times at least. The ripples run over the fish and join them a little bit, which is a nice unifier for the composition too. For the most part, I am copying just what is there. And if it doesn't work later, I will change it. Next, I move on to the goldfish on top. Not that he's a goldfish, but he is a golden colored koi. And I should say she, her name is Aura. 
we named all of our fish. We have about 60 fish in there. And the way that we had the most fish was that they propagated and had little ones. One of the harder parts of painting these fish was getting their mouths right. I'd never painted the inside of a fish mouth before, and I did a lot of observation. The mouth is not just a hole. It's banded muscle, and it surrounds like a cylinder going down into the fish's tummy. Even getting the color right was a challenge. I'm using primarily blues and grays for my shading. Many of the fish have white colored undersides. But as they go down into the water, they don't appear white. They also have some eyelid structure and some lip structure. Starting to get the mouth right on the goldfish, so I'm working on the fish that's underneath. Now that's a light colored fish, but it has to be dark enough to stand out against the one on top. So I'm carefully building up my shading so that they will stand out from each other and not just be a big blended mass, but not to make it too dark. So I'm pretty pleased with how this tracing approach has worked because it seems to be giving me an interesting feature of how the water plays against the fish captured in this moment of time. And you see me accenting with little dorks all along the outside of the fish without making a straightforward outline picking up on the depths around the fish, but not solidly, so it looks natural. And each time I do, the fish appear to emerge or show up better and better. If you make things too dark, you know the obvious solution is to paint a little water on it and blot it off. and getting to the stages of adjustment, that's a lot of what I did.
Another layer of orange going on. Make sure your rinse water is clean when you're adding brights after you used a lot of blues. Otherwise, your layers and glazes are not going to be bright colored. You're going to cancel your brights very slowly if you glaze on top with grayed down water. Keep your water clean, folks. Careful, detailed outlining to get the eye rightly placed and looking logical anatomically for a koi fish. So I'm balancing out the top with a little more dark. I'm taking a break from the fish. Now as I'm working on the water, I'm also starting to blend some of the sections together so the demarcation lines are not quite so hard. In some cases I like them to be hard, in others I want them softer, so I'm using damp brush blending. As my photo was shot, the light colored fish on the right or on the far left was not showing. So I decided to darken the water around him. And then she does stand out better. With the fish basically painted in, this is now my time for adjusting values, for putting more shading in, for making things stand out against each other that look too blended. And that's what I'll be doing from this point on. One of the hardest parts, painting in all those little sections and getting them right, is done. Now it's a matter of adjusting, blending, and accenting. So I'm softening some of the water and then I'll be going in to evaluate what else needs to be brought out more or taken down more. Here you can see that I'm enhancing the difference between the top fish and the white fish underneath. Accenting around the fins more. as well as into the water around the fish.
Yeah, it was interesting painting this and watching it come together section by section and then layer by layer. What do you think? Is this an approach you'd like to try? It really was painstaking and time consuming. But there's some unique qualities about this approach that I really enjoyed. And I'm enjoying the, the way it's coming out too. I'm done and I'm signing. I hope you enjoyed my video, how I painted hungry koi. And they were very hungry that, that day. As they surfaced and opened their mouths, I shot a lot of photographs. And this is one of them. I might try another one too, because I really like the color play of the blues against the oranges. It's a nice complimentary color scheme. If you liked my video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. It's helpful to me when you subscribe. And if I get more viewers, that's helpful to me as well. I welcome you to give me a comment. And if you have a question, I will try very hard to answer it and respond to it. There's some other links down below that you can check out. And I hope that you uh, do so and click on anything that looks of interest. I'll see you next video, and thanks for watching. Keep on painting.